This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. I think you'll agree it's a very grand room, um, although part of the t- um, title of the afternoon's seminar involves a major world thinker and another one, the President of the United States of America, so um, grandness isn't necessarily inapposite. I should say that if you uh, came expecting a cast of thousands, we apologise in advance that the panel is constituted in its plenitude here now. Um, we have been ambushed by uh, Thanksgiving, uh, by the um, urgency of parliamentary business, uh, and by lawyers uh, getting uh, graduated. But we are still confident that we'll have a, an enlightening, illuminating, and enjoyable discussion uh, this evening when we talk about Marx and Lincoln. Uh, and we effectively launch or contribute towards the launch of this book, An Unfinished Revolution, Karl Marx and Abraham Lincoln, uh, written and edited by Robin Blackman, who sits fittingly to my left. Robin is a professor of sociology at the University of Essex, and I don't need to take you through his um, <coughs> publications, some of which are available in the very handsome flyer on the uh, on the chairs around you. I would, though, like to add that he's held positions at the, or actually, he still holds a position at the New School of uh, um, Social Research in New York, at King's College in Cambridge, at Flagstaff uh, in Quito in Ecuador, uh, and at the Woodrow Wilson Center. He's a member of the editorial committee of New Left Review and has been since 1962, and he was editor between 1981. And 1999. Uh, to my right, uh, no political uh, aspersions uh, intended whatsoever, is Dr. Adam Smith, who's a senior lecturer of history uh, at University College London, and he will be providing some comments after Robin has talked um, for about half an hour uh, on, on the book that, uh, <coughs> that's before you and is on the desk at the back. Adam uh, is an expert on United States history. Um, Amongst his books are No Party Now, Politics in the Civil War North, Oxford University Press, 2006, uh, and The American Civil War, Power Grave, 2007. He's currently engaged on a book project studying conservatism in the United States between 1948 and 1976, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, Without further ado, then, I should hand over to Rob. Thank you very much. Well, uh, as you might have gathered from James's introduction, there's a relationship between this uh, book that I've edited and sort of put together and introduced and my larger study of the rise of slavery in the New World in all parts of the Americas. Uh, and um, uh, the, the this, the linked attempt to explain uh, the circumstances that led to the overthrow of the very rich and important um, systems of New World slavery. Systems that at their height, and their height was 1860, a date which is going to be very significant for looking at um, this strange connection between Marx and Lincoln. Um, uh, at that time, there were six million slaves in the Americas, which is roughly about as many slaves as there were in the ancient world at the height of uh, the Roman Empire. So um, slavery was hugely important uh, in the New World in, in the mid-19th century, at the time when um, Abraham Lincoln was developing his political career and Karl Marx was developing his criticism of capitalism. And actually, if you look at Marx's writings, he is quite emphatic that uh, in many ways, um, 
the free labor of uh, Western Europe and, uh, and the metropolis uh, is actually based on the, the, the disguised slavery of, of wage labor is based on the naked uh, oppression and slavery uh, of the system of chattel bondage in, in the Americas, in, in the empire of Brazil, in Cuba, and above all in the US South. Uh, and um, some of Marx's basic approach to the study of capitalism and the fact that it was right for overthrow can be transformed and uh, applied uh, with some adjustments uh, to what happened to the mighty systems of uh, colonial slavery and the system of um, uh, chattel and plantation slavery in the parts of the Americas I've just been talking about. Um, basically what we have uh, here is, um, well first slavery consolidated in the New World uh, in the 17th and 18th century because it, it fitted in so well with the new demands of a, a society undergoing a transition to uh, capitalism and industrialization uh, with new demand for consumer products, above all sugar, coffee, and cotton, a vital raw material for the industrializing capitalist world. Uh, and so there was a new world of wants, there was a new world of cash uh, um, relationships, uh, a, a new type of consumerism, uh, which and the plantation slavery had proved to be the most rapid and effective way to bring into production the fertile lands of the New World and to bring them to bear on the new consuming public. Uh, and this was a public that was consuming not just because it wanted to, but because it, uh, to some extent, had to. It was a new uh, type of uh, uh, dynamism that was led uh, to production uh, by the unlimited wants of these expanding markets linked to salaries and fees and rents uh, and wages. Uh, now, Marx and Lincoln seem rather strange individuals to bring in relation to one another, obviously because Marx was a revolutionary anti-capitalist and because Abraham Lincoln plausibly and, and also in a way by his own, uh, as he would say himself, uh, stood for the world of business. Uh, of course, uh, he, he even acted as a, a lawyer for railroad corporations. Uh, he was never very keen on the connections with slavery in the South. Uh, right from the earliest days, he was disturbed. Uh, he found them an element of lawlessness in the uh, American body politic. And there's a way in which both Marx and and, and Lincoln do have something in common, which is that both of them, their political positions, uh, their philosophical standpoint, is very much animated by a detestation of unrequited labor, uh, of um, uh, the exploitation of the laboring person. Uh, now, I should say that there's something in Lincoln's background which predisposed him a bit in this direction. Uh, and that is that he'd actually worked on his father's farm until the age of 21 without pay. And in fact, his father was even in the um, habit of hiring out his son Abraham to his uh, neighbors and not handing the money uh, for the hire uh, to Abraham. Uh, and actually, there were cool relations between father and son, uh, you know, subsequently. And he had really quite little to do with his father. Um, in many other ways, they do appear quite different because uh, Karl Marx, as we know, was the product of what was then uh, the leading university system uh, in the world. Uh, he had a doctorate in philosophy. Uh, he was enormously imbued with, with debates and struggles around the legacy of, of Hegel and, and German idealist philosophy. Uh, Lincoln apparently was uh, the very obvious because uh, uh, he had, rem uh, again this is a remarkable fact, uh, 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 that he had only one year of formal schooling. Um, however, it's a little misleading uh, because 
uh, curiously enough, there was once again a, a certain link uh, back um, to the intellectual background of Karl Marx, because uh, Lincoln, um, in the course of uh, learning how to become a lawyer and a, a barrister, uh, acquired um, knowledge of um, legal theory, uh, and they actually had a, a law partner, uh, uh, Richard Herndon, who was a great enthusiast for um, a number of philosophers uh, who were known as the New England Transcendentalists. And the main source of inspiration for these so-called transcendentalist philosophers, people like Theodore Parker, George Bancroft, uh, and um, uh, Emerson, uh, that the, the, the main issues that preoccupied and obsessed them uh, had to do with the issues that had been raised by the German idealist philosophy and <coughs> current. Uh, and in fact, uh, Bancroft spent um, uh, many years at Heidelberg. Uh, 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 they all of them read German. Uh, and uh, uh, there's no doubt that Lincoln was primed with uh, copies and pamphlets and books uh, by Parker and, and Emerson, who he also met and um, respected, uh, uh, and um, Bancroft. Um, in fact, um, Gary Wills has written a book on the background of Get Gettysburg Address, where he shows that uh, it echoes ideas and actual words, uh, which are to be found there in, uh, uh, in, the, in, in above all in the writings of Theodore Parker. Uh, I should also say, it's something I quote chapter and verse in the book, that uh, the famous formulation about democracy in the Gettysburg Address finds a sort of slight echo uh, in Marx's writing about the commune, and uh, that's something that was pointed out by Hal Draper, who's a very authoritative uh, commentator on Marx's political theory. So there are some interesting back common themes in the background there, uh, despite the very great political um, divergence. Uh, and, um, well, uh, I must say, uh, when I was working my way, I mean, it was important to me to um, establish how the great system of, uh, of slavery uh, had been destroyed. And it is uh, a great paradox, because uh, not only were there more slaves in 1860 than ever before, but the value of slave commerce was actually greater uh, uh, than ever before. Uh, and um, the great, the, the huge quantities of cotton were really very important to um, uh, the cotton industry, the cotton textile industry, which was really the first major sector that was thoroughly transformed by the Industrial Revolution. Um, now, as it happened, industrial capitalism was able to adjust to uh, uh, the, the uh, abolition of slavery uh, in the United States. Uh, but it certainly created some very difficult times, and I'll say a little bit about that later. Um, uh, and certainly it was not something that was wel welcomed in any way by the cotton manufacturers or the big merchants who uh, had such a lively trade, not only with the US South, but with Cuba and Brazil as well. And I may say, all passo, but um, James Dunkley's um, Americana contains fascinating information on the uh, great importance of Cuba and Brazil uh, in the Atlantic commerce of this time, far overshadowing the rest of, of Latin America. Uh, so we've got to keep that in view as well as what was happening in the United States. And, and really the defense of, of slavery, I mean, 1860 is a date uh, long after anti-slavery had appeared to make major gains, uh, above all in France, revolutionary France, and then later uh, in Britain. Um, but uh, it had still stubbornly held out, and in fact it held out in the land that were most suitable for extensive slave cultivation, which were not the little islands of the Caribbean, but rather the very big island of the Caribbean, Cuba, and then Brazil and, and the United States, which had just had the vastness of territory needed for the major expansion in slave cultivation. Uh, and really what had uh, helped 
the slaveholders through very difficult revolutionary times is they've been able to build up powerful states that they control above all the empire of Brazil and the and the, uh, this, the, the, the US Republic, and that they've been able to appeal to the sacredness of property, and they've been able to appeal to race, and they've been able to appeal to um, uh, the supreme interest uh, of uh, the nation. Uh, so n national sentiment, um, respect, uh, the idea that you know, if, if we get rid of slavery, uh, uh, other nations will simply exploit our our, our <coughs> uh, The idea that um, descendants of Africans and black people uh, uh, were such a, an awkward presence uh, that they needed to be restrained uh, for the good of society and for the good of production, um, and the idea that. Um, that the, the slaves were anyway, even though slavery was perhaps deplorable, but they were legitimately acquired property and that this must be respected. Well, uh, in my American Crucible, the big study of um, the whole history of slavery, I see two big turning points. One is really the Haitian Revolution at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. And then the other turning point is the American Civil War. Um, uh, and um, so I want to now come on to um, looking at Marx and uh, the Americans uh, and above all Marx in the United States. Uh, I should say that I was a, a little puzzled uh, when I looked into this matter. First to discover that Marx had had the idea of um, emigrating to the United States. Uh, in fact, he was planning to go to Texas uh, uh, in 1844 or 1845. And he actually applied for an immigration certificate from his hometown of Tria to do this. Um, but he soon gave up that idea. However, in the course of the 1848 revolution, when he was editing uh, the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, uh, he met Charles Dana, or Charles Dana, one of the publishers of the New York Daily Tribune, met Karl Marx and um, decided, and he subsequently on a trip to London decided to invite Marx to become the foreign correspondent, in effect the chief correspondent, foreign correspondent for the New York Daily Tribune. And I myself uh, always known that he, he'd written for this newspaper. I hadn't quite appreciated um, that uh, he'd uh, actually written a, a total of, of nearly 800 articles and, and editorials for that newspaper over a period of seven or eight years. Uh, that uh, uh, not uh, about 200 of those were not published, but about 600 of them were published. Uh, uh, and um, Marx was intensely annoyed when uh, they didn't publish them uh, because they didn't pay for, for, for articles that they didn't print. Uh, he was also very annoyed that they sometimes changed the, um, uh, you know, they, they monkeyed around with the articles that he sent them, or even published them anonymously after having changed them a bit. Uh, and incidentally, he felt this as an experience of exploitation and complains mightily in his letters to Engels about this. But, um, so Marx was actually known in America, and possibly one of the reasons Dana had to recruit him is that there was a powerful German-American emigration amounting to hundreds of thousands uh, each year from 1848 after the defeat of the 1848 revolution. And this was a strong projection of, and above all these uh, uh, emigrants went to the Northwest uh, and um, they became supporters of the Republican Party uh, and they became supporters of, uh, they naturally inclined towards anti-slavery politics. Uh, they also helped to, to introduce a more secular type of politics uh, that had hitherto uh, prevailed uh, uh, in the free soil and um, anti-slavery ranks, which were strongly influenced by evangelicalism. So the Germans come in and introduce more secularism. They also are less obsessed than the evangelicals with the campaign of temperance against the demon drink. 
uh, and um, uh, I think that they probably somewhat helped to enhance the, um, the, the uh, political strength of the Republican Party by detaching it from a very strong identification with temperance and, and sort of anti-alcoholic uh, propaganda. Uh, and instead, the Germans have a, a culture which stresses the beer garden as well, it should be said, as the kindergarten which they introduce into American public life. Uh, but the beer garden and the, uh, 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 the gym and um, uh, the world of patriotic songs and sort of merrymaking, uh, in, but combined with sort of consumption of beer. Uh, so you, you get a new cult Republican culture uh, which springs up and uh, it helps to rebalance the, the Republican Party and, and perhaps to uh, uh, helps it to overcome its nativist rivals in the so-called Know Nothing Party. Um, now, I should just say that when the Civil War breaks out with the secession of the Confederacy, uh, quite a lot of democratic opinion uh, and left-wing opinion in Europe actually sympathised with the Confederacy and certainly didn't support the North because it was felt that, uh, you know, majorities uh, had assembled uh, and had approved these secessions. It was just like Belgium seceding from uh, uh, the, the Low Countries in, in, in 1830. Uh, it seemed democratic self-determination and above all there was the argument that slavery had nothing to do with the quarrel. Uh, and this is really where we see Marx having a, a structuralist analysis of the politics of the, of the emerging two contenders and protagonists and say uh, uh, that actually at the political level um, it is the interest of slaveholders that requires them to absolutely control the state. And the reason they've seceded is that within the old union that they were seceding from, the growth of the Northwest, uh, where all those Germans had gone, um, the growth of the Northwest was putting the slaveholders into a minority and robbing them of their blocking position within the structures of the US, the, the state in Washington, DC. Uh, so he has this structuralist analysis that quite early aligns him with support uh, for, for the North and the Union, and he uh, confidently declares, and I think these are some of Marx's most brilliant writings on a political conjuncture that you'll find there that I've reprinted and then also let me reprint, you know, eight or nine of the most uh, effective essays. Uh, uh, there are actually almost as many that uh, we won't be able to fit into this book. But we've selected, I think, some of the most uh, insightful. And um, I, I now want to um, uh, say that uh, Lincoln was probably aware of, I mean, he, it's, it's quite likely he read quite a bit of Marx because he was a reader of the Tribune. And uh, 600 articles of, of Marxism have been published there. So it's, it's highly likely you would have read many of them, whether or not he registered the name. Um, he certainly would have been aware of that uh, not only did the German Americans uh, tend to support the Republicans, uh, but they also, on the outbreak of war, had played a key role in developing militia. Uh, they, many of them had some military experience. Uh, in St. Louis, for example, uh, it was a German militia that prevented that strategic key city from falling into Confederate hands uh, 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 through the maneuvers of the governor and the head of the very important military depot in that, in that city. Uh, if you look at Marx and Engels' correspondence, and we have uh, quite a bit of it uh, in, in the book, uh, they're continually mentioning, you know, Auguste Willig, uh, from the Communist League, he has become a general. Uh, uh, Joseph Weidermeyer, uh, uh, he's a colonel and actually in charge of the defense of St. Louis. Uh, this is someone, Joseph Weidermeyer, that I knew about, of course, because he's a very important correspondent for Marx, and there are certain key questions in interpreting 
uh, you know, Marx's political theory that you refer to, a, you know, paragraphs from Joseph Feynman. But it's interesting that he was also founding a workers' league, a workers' league which was to be open to all, regardless of sex, race, religion. This is a very interesting um, uh, 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 universalistic approach which uh, Marx and his sympathizers and, supported, uh, and supporters uh, uh, were to develop and the contribution they made. I mean, th there are elements of this also in uh, the anti-slavery uh, tradition that they, that they themselves, that they found there, but uh, they certainly contributed to it. Uh, eventually, 200,000 German Americans joined the Union Army and 40,000 of them fight in detachments that actually speak German, uh, where the commanders and officers and the language of command is, is German. Uh, Marx himself writes extraordinary, perhaps with Engels' help, uh, uh, analysis of the, of the military conjuncture and of uh, how the, the Lincoln's generals are following the wrong path and that actually they should be trying to split the Confederacy, not to squeeze it uh, in accordance. And interestingly enough, uh, he's sending an article on this topic that we reprint in the book, a March 1862 article, to Charles Danner, just at the moment when Charles Danner is actually with General Grant, uh, uh, who later comes to champion this uh, uh, strategy, or who at that time is already developing really that strategy. I don't, I don't honestly suggest that Grant uh, read Marx. Uh, 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 it's not something, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's just possible that Darwin did give him some sort of, because he maintained correspondence with Marx, give him some, uh, you know, explain this is what these German American uh, uh, people think about strategy uh, in the war. Um, now, um, I, I want to say that I think Marx is basic cast of thought was influenced in big ways by the, um, by the war. Uh, and in particular, I would like to uh, say that he had a schematic view uh, prior to the outbreak of the war that slaves, because of their extreme dependency on their owners, would not have the possibilities, the freedom of association that was needed to develop a culture of opposition and revolutionary alternative to the established order. And really the new wage earning proletariat was distinguished because it was the first class in history that would have the exploited class, that would have the capacity if it conquered a democratic gains, if it uh, introduced uh, educational measures, it would be able to develop into a, a successful uh, revolutionary class against the established order. Well, the schematism involved in this, uh, which wouldn't withstand close study of the Haitian Revolution, for example, uh, is very much relaxed by Marx as he begins to look at what's happening in North America in the early days of the Civil War. And it's very interesting that uh, m one of the things he writes to Engels is, you know, I'm reading Appian's account of uh, the, the um, social war in the ancient Roman world, and I'm so impressed by this man Spartacus. Uh, uh, he's absolutely splendid, he defeats three Roman generals, and he is a real leader of the ancient proletariat. So Marx didn't have much difficulty abandoning his own schema schematic views and replacing them with a much uh, uh, more valid one. Around this same time, uh, supporters of first the Marxist current, and secondly, of the International Working Men's Association, founded in 1864. Uh, they begin to diffuse the idea that a key, uh, and, to, and they absorb uh, that American workers have been struggling, for example, for the eight hour day. Uh, they introduce American workers to ideas of uh, 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 programmatic ideas, but they also absorb ideas from them. And um, according to Raya Dunayevskaya, she did a close study of, of the manuscripts of Capital, uh, and um, uh, she, she pointed out the interesting fact that Marx's absolutely vital reflections on the length of the working day were all written in 1864, 65, 
just at the time when this agitation was at its and Marx's period of most political activity, founding the first international, coincides also with this period uh, uh, when um, he's writing Capital. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, 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 and with the formation of the, uh, of, of, of the, the first international, we get the episode which in a way is a, a sort of a brief but sort of not uh, insignificant encounter, or almost encounter, a mediated encounter between Marx and, and uh, I'll really sort of conclude on this point because I think I'm trespassing beyond the time I said I would. <coughs> Is that right or wrong? Oh, no, no. I've got a few more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically, um, Lincoln goes to re-election in 1864 and is re-elected, although to begin with it looks very difficult and Marx and Engels are very worried when they write to one another. To begin with, they were a bit sceptical about Lincoln. But after the Emancipation Proclamation, and um, when it was made uh, uh, final and definitive in January 1863, from that point on, Marx at least has no doubts about Lincoln and thinks that he grasps the essence of the matter. And he also acquires quite a respect for Wendell Phillips and some of the other uh, US abolitionists who he, he, he begins to understand better. Uh, and so uh, it's interesting that he chooses um, to suggest, to propose to the uh, uh, international that they should send an address uh, to the um, re-elected Abraham Lincoln uh, and um, congratulating him on, on that re-election and saying that the American Civil War is going to be a turning point for the 19th century just as big as the, uh, the French Revolution was and the American uh, Revolution was for the 18th century. Uh, and the interesting thing is Lincoln at this point is receiving not just hundreds but in fact thousands of letters and messages and addresses uh, uh, um, every week and yet he chooses to reply to this one coming from the International Working Men's Association which is signed by, amongst others, Karl Marx who actually drafted it. Uh, and um, it's very likely that the, uh, this is down to Charles Francis Adams, uh, the US ambassador in London, a very close political associate of, of Lincoln. Lincoln, of course, was very keen that Britain should not in any way, the British government should be restrained from recognizing the Confederacy. And he was appreciative that British trade unions and German uh, revolutionaries had been amongst those restraining um, continental governments and, and French socialists had been amongst those who were restraining Paris and London from recognizing the Confederacy. So that would have been a factor in why he chose to reply. He does raise the issue of free labor and slavery. Both uh, writers do. And I reproduce the complete text of those documents there. Uh, with Marx is very disturbed uh, by the assassination of uh, of Lincoln and by the reactionary turn of his successor, uh, President Andrew Johnson. And in particular, he um, uh, says that Johnson's hatred of the Negroes uh, uh, strikes a deeply worrying note, and that before we know where uh, we are, uh, all the uh, villains of succession will be back in, in Washington. So and he's then very keen on uh, reconstruction, and he is keen. Uh, on the foundation of trade unions and the development of uh, 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 radical working class politics, uh, uh, the eight hour day demand becoming even more central than before. And I do give an account of the first international in North America and of the emergence of, for example, many new trade unions. Many American trade unions, you may remember, have the word international in their name. And this seems to date from the period of the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, 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 and um, just to give you an example of, of how really in the later 19th century, there are ways in which the American workers' movement is ahead of the European workers' movement in militancy, in the scale and size of strikes. Um, and um, there's a moment uh, early on in the um, period of Reconstruction when the news comes through of the massacre of the Communards in 
period of the, uh, of the, um, the Paris Commune. And um, I just think it's remarkable that uh, you, you'd expect there's reactions from all there are reactions from all parts of Europe to this um, ass uh, 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 the, the assassination of, of the of the communal. But what is most interesting is that there's a gigantic demonstration in New York, and um, it's it's published across two pages in the book, reproduced across two pages. It, it was said to have a hundred thousand people. This is December the seventeenth, I think, eighteen seventy one. A uh, huge demonstration, larger than anything in Europe. And you see there, uh, first, uh, the Skidmore Guards, which is a black militia. Uh, then you have uh, the leaders of Section uh, 12, uh, which is the feminist leaders, uh, Victoria Woodhull, who's later to run as candidate for president, because although women can't vote, there's nothing in the Constitution saying they can't stand for president. Um, trade unionists, uh, a, a contingent of Cubans marching behind the Cuban flag. Cuba is at this time fighting for its independence from Spain, uh, and so on and so forth. So a, a tremendous vision, and this is a, a, one of the illustrated weeklies of New York, which uh, portrays this impressive scene. Uh, so, um, uh, of course, uh, great repression eventually uh, puts a stop to all this radicalization. Uh, and that's a long story I'll just summarize. But there are tremendous currents of, of radicalism in the trade union movement, in the Knights of Labour, in the populist movement, which uh, urges the nationalization of the great railroads. Uh, but at the same time, there's Pinkerton's men, there's naked violence. What would have happened if Lincoln had lived? Who knows? Some of the radical Republicans go over to the side of labor. Others go over to the, and are corrupted by uh, the famous robber barons who ride roughshod. Uh, Marx is quite gripped by these battles, above all the great strike of 1877. And I'll just conclude uh, uh, with a mention of that great strike. Uh, uh, one of its uh, central points is um, St. Louis, in fact. Uh, the workers actually keep the, the railways going and the buses going and take the fares, uh, so they have a sort of active strike, uh, uh, continuing to provide the service, but not giving the money uh, to the bosses. Um, a, a feature of the strike in that city uh, is that the leaders of the black community in, in St. Louis are invited onto the platform and part of the leadership. Uh, the thing is organized by what had been until yesterday the, the section of the international in that city. So um, I just would end by saying that uh, uh, although, and it's why it's an unfinished revolution, there's, in the South there's uh, lynch law, uh, Jim Crow, so that's a defeat. Although there'd been workers who took over successfully big plantations in South Carolina, but eventually they're crushed. Uh, there'd been black, 600 black elected officials, but they're driven uh, 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 from their positions by um, racial violence and uh, uh, terrorism, uh, the Ku Klux Klan and, and so forth. And in the North, Pinkerton's men are used also to repress the, the trade union movement. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it, it's really Jack London's Iron Heel or, uh, you know, so many other American visions of uh, class struggle. Uh, it's almost as if America is the country we all know that never had socialism or a welfare state or a labor movement, but actually it did. It certainly had a labor movement. Um, the May the 1st Labor Day commemorates the Haymarket Martyrs of 1886. So, uh, and there's a way in which the, the top hat in cigar chomping capitalist uh, is uh, an American figure. And in a way, the, even the Soviet worker in his blue overalls and Rosie the Riveter, you know, these, this is the American image, uh, culturally, of the, of the working class. So it's all stuff that was happening long ago, but I don't think it's entirely irrelevant. I think there are some of those traditions still there, and we live in a moment when um, American workers have just um, campaigned strongly
to restore labor rights uh, in Ohio, and they've done so with some success. So I don't think it's all just ancient history. I think it has um, you know, a message for us uh, for the present as well. Robin, thank you very much. Now we'll move to our discussion. Adam Smith. Thank you, James. Thank you, and thank you very much, um, Robin, for, for your um, talk and, uh, and, and for your um, book, which, which I uh, found, um, uh, I mean, firstly, I think, if I may say so, just as a, as a, um, as a brisk, um, um, perceptive summary of the, of the coming of the American Civil War and the course of the Civil War, I think it's absolutely superb. And I shall certainly be recommending it to people as a um, on on, the, on that basis alone. But 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 more more than that, of course, it's it's the I mean, Robin is is the person um, of all scholars I can think of most qualified, I think, to to venture into this um, terrain of, of bringing Marx and and uh, Lincoln together. Um, and as he explained uh, in his talk now, and, and as he does so well in, uh, in his book here, um, th these are figures who, I mean, there is a superficial um, similarity in, uh, in appearance. They're both um, bewhiskered Victorian uh, gentlemen, seemingly embodying, if you just look at the image, bourgeois respectability. Um, both of them were not uh, really that uh, at all in some respects. And more importantly than that, both of them spent um, um, most of their lives concerned with the question of the organisation of labour in some form. Both of them were preoccupied with the question of how uh, to um, reconcile their idea of um, progress and of the emancipation of human potential in a context of a changing political economy. Um, the uh, anti-slavery movement with which Lincoln um, belatedly became um, associated was viciously attacked by pro-slavery writers in the American South precisely um, on the grounds that it um, was communistic or socialist. Um, I mean, Robin's larger work about um, his magnificent big book about um, slavery and emancipation addresses these kinds of questions. It's, it's, it's certainly true from my own um, work that uh, I know very well that the, the pro-slavery writers perceive the attack on property, the attack on slave property, to be, um, um, uh, to be as, um, to, to, to come from the same intellectual root and to be animated by the same kinds of dangerous forces from their perspective. Um, as did um, socialist ideas that were circulating at the same time. And so there is this uh, interesting point, which I'm not sure that Robin does make in his book, that in his lifetime, Lincoln was accused of being a socialist, <laughs> not, not um, by very many people who he, not by many people in the North, um, but, but, but certainly Southerners responded to his election using that kind of, um, using that kind of language. But for all those similarities, of course, um, there are, um, as Robin also makes clear, some um, important but quite illuminating differences. I think what's so interesting about this moment, the 1850s and 60s, which, in, if you like, is a, is a, a sort of pre-Marxian moment. I mean, Marx is there and Marx is writing extensively, but it's a moment um, before uh, Marx's canonical works have, have been um, written and disseminated before the, 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 the uh, doctrines associated with the idea of Marxism have been clearly formulated. It's a, it's a moment in the 1850s and late 1840s through to the, to the 1860s, in, certainly in the context of the United States, I think of great plasticity in, the, the radical, um, in radical um, politics. Um, and it's, it's this that enables um, um, through his um, writings for the New York Tribune and, the, and many of the, the um, German-Americans who came after 1848, Robert was talking about, and many other um, people who adopted, um, were influenced by European socialist ideas. Um, it's this that enabled these people and these radical socialist ideas to be absorbed into other uh, 
to more mainstream, to very mainstream currents of American thinking. Horace Greeley is um, a very good example. Here. Horace Greeley is the was the um, founder and editor of the New York Tribune, and he continued to be in practice the editor of that newspaper until um, 1862 or 1863. Um, he was um, an extraordinarily mercurial figure in some ways. He worked like Lincoln, had worked his way up from uh, poverty uh, as a journeyman printer, got work as a journeyman printer, and eventually started um, his own paper, which pioneered using new technology, um, uh, the, the penny press, um, peddling sensationalist accounts of um, murder cases and um, court reports and, um, and that sort of thing. Um, but when he founded the, the New York Tribune, which wasn't a marginal paper, by the way, this was throughout the 1840s and 50s and 60s, the big, by far the biggest circulating newspaper in the United States. It, it, it um, was one of the first newspapers to make extensive use of the telegraph um, to bring news quickly, read, especially during the Civil War, um, issued many uh, editions during the day with the latest news and so on. It used the new railroads to distribute copies of the New York Tribune across the nation, and indeed, uh, and indeed to, 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 to Europe on, on steamships. Um, but Greeley described himself again and again throughout most of his, his fascinating and strange political career as a socialist. Um, he was a founder of the Republican Party, but he was a socialist, and he saw no contradiction at all between those two things. It's, an, it's always something worth mentioning if you're ever in uh, right-wing American circles to talk to, um, not that I very often am, but uh, if you uh, talk to, American, to, to Republicans about the socialist origins of some of the founders of their um, party, you get some very um, strange looks. But it was, it was absolutely true. Greeley um, uh, uh, was principally influenced by the writings of, um, of, uh, of Fourier. Uh, as was um, uh, Dana, who um, uh, Robin uh, mentioned, and Park Godwin, who was the managing editor of the New York Tribune for most of these years and later became its editor when Horace Greeley stepped down. Um, and they used the New York Tribune to campaign for um, um, the ideas that uh, Fourier had um, had. Um, put forward particularly communitarian ideas. He, there were a number of Fourier associations or phalanxes, as they were called, founded in the um, mainly in the West in the 1840s, and most of them um, failed abysmally after a few years. Sometimes there's a great bit of sexual scandal attached to them, and fires burning down storehouses, and various disasters attack the movement. But despite all that, um, Greeley stuck to these associationist ideas. The 1848 revolution, hugely influential, pushing Greeley uh, in a radical direction, advocating um, more state intervention, um, advocating regulation of everything from public education to public health um, to um, the um, intervention by the state. He wasn't quite calling for the nationalization of the railroads, but calling for heavy regulation of it, uh, of them. And Greeley is probably most famous now, I mean, if he's famous at all in this country, I'm not sure, but he, but he is of some resonance in the United States for, for allegedly saying, go west, young man, when a, um, in Pekin, uh, when a, when a, when a poor um, New York, um, uh, when a poor New York, New Yorker um, apparently was complaining to him of the, of the lack of work. And this is often presented as evidence that Greeley was um, uh, an advocate of rugged individualism. It's often seen as the epitome of the, you know, the, the, uh, the frontier idea of, uh, of America as the, the frontier being the, 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 the crucible of this kind of pioneering individualism and anti-statism. And really nothing could have been further from the truth. Uh, if Greeley did ever say, and it's, it's all a bit apocryphal, but if he ever did say, go west, young man, he's most likely been saying, go west and join a Fourier phalanx. He's most likely been saying, go west in order to find a place where you can create um, with your fellow men a new kind of community. That's much more likely, uh, I think, or at least that's, that's a perfectly plausible interpretation of, of Greeley's um, uh, alleged remark. Um, so, um, this was 
in other words, this moment of, um, uh, of plasticity in the 1840s and 50s. And this was the context in which uh, uh, Lincoln uh, came into politics. Now, Lincoln, uh, as Robin said, was a reader of the New York Tribune. He wasn't um, in that social, what we could call the social democratic wing of the Whig Party. Um, um, uh, he was, but he was, um, uh, Self, he was a self-made man in, in every sense, I mean, he, in the sort of modern sense of having made money, but, but more importantly in the 19th century sense of having instructed his self, of having worked hard through self-education to construct a respectable um, persona. Um, and Lincoln, but Lincoln, um, the, the curious thing about Lincoln in relation to thinking about these strains of, of European radicalism, socialism, social democracy, and the, the influence of Marx, the, the, the frustrating thing about Lincoln is, is uh, it's not his fault, but that he was shot when he was. This is something that Robin referred to at the end. And the fascinating thing is, is um, ultimately, it's something that we can't answer, but is to speculate about what, what direction Lincoln might have gone in after 1865. Only there'd be people who have imagined Lincoln, I mean, in, I'm thinking of, of a rather uh, uh, bad counterfactual historical novel that I read many years ago, which imagined Lincoln in the 1890s as an itinerant socialist lecturer. Um, uh, I think that's probably pushing the bounds of plausibility a little bit far, but his um, close colleague in the Illinois Republican Party, a sort of co-founder of the Illinois Republican Party in some ways, a man called Lyman Trumbull, who was a senator for Illinois, um, during the during the uh, the Republican Party in the 1850s and 60s, um, left the Republican Party in the 1870s to join the Democrats as a direct result of um, his perception. That Robin alluded to this: the Republican the Republican Party has it been what we've now said been captured by corporate elites and was um, um, rejecting its, um, its 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 radical uh, origins. And uh, Trumbull joined the Democrats in order to campaign for labour rights, and then he ended up—he ended his long political career in the 1890s in the People's Party in the Populist movement. And um, so, it, 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 th th that is at least one one plausible route down which uh, Lincoln Lincoln may have gone. Um, in his in his lifetime, if we were to sort of begin, uh, if we were to attempt any kind of counterfactual speculation about where Lincoln may have been uh, been headed. Um, the, the, the premise has to be that the, the world that Lincoln advocated, um, the basis of his understanding of political economy, uh, was derived from his own experience of growing up in, in, in uh, Indiana and, and mostly in Illinois uh, in the 1830s and 40s and 50s. And that was a world of small producers um, without big concentrations of capital. Um, without monopolistic corporations like the big railroad companies that came to dominate that region and prompted in large part the populist result, revolt of the 1890s. And that was a world that, well, it hadn't disappeared at the time of Lincoln's assassination in 1865, but it was under serious assault. And the huge changes that took place in American political economy in the, in the in years after the Civil War um, in some ways as a consequence of northern victory in the Civil War, ironically undermined this world of small producers um, that Lincoln had, had, um, had advocated. I mean, it, Lincoln, um, in, a, in a speech in, in 1858, um, Lincoln talked, um, I mean, he talked many times about the relationship between capital and labor, actually. I mean, it was one of his principal themes. I mean, as, as, um, as, as Robin has identified, I mean, you know, he, the, the basis of his critique of slavery, as with many other, um, as with many other members of the Republican Party, was based on his his fundamental moral um, objection to the idea that the fruits of one's labor could be illegitimately uh, taken away. But um, in a speech at the, I think it was at the Wisconsin State Fair in 1858, he laid out most extensively his his understanding of the relationship between capital and labor. And th this, is, this is some of what he, he said. He said, there's no such thing as a man being fixed for life in the condition of a hired laborer. Labor is prior to and independent of capital. In fact, capital is the fruit of labor. And he goes on to argue that um, 
that a majority of Americans, even in the slave states, are neither capitalists nor wage laborers, um, but um, work for them, but basically work for themselves. Um, the prudent and penniless beginner in the world, Lincoln said, and very possibly thinking of himself here, labors for wages a while, saves a surplus with which to buy tools or land for himself, then labors on his own account another while, and at length uh, hires another new beginner to help him. So this is this very idealized, slightly romantic notion of the place that wage labor has in uh, a capitalist economy. But it's one, I mean, we can call it um, idealized, but it's one that comports exactly with Lincoln's own autobiography, with Lincoln's own experience. And now the critical question is how to interpret Lincoln on this. Uh, and in particular, how to interpret him in relation to what is, you know, if you were sort of playing a, a kind of, um, uh, you know, a, a sort of, I was going to say some pub quiz, but if you're just sort of, if you're sitting around and trying to debate just for the fun of it, you had to identify what the, the, the single biggest transformation was, or the single most important development across the 19th century world, or perhaps particularly anywhere in the United States, then I might nominate as an answer to that question the spread of wage labor. If you look at the United States in 1800 and you look at the United States in 1900, the dramatic difference in the condition of life across that century is that in 1900 the vast majority of people are wage laborers and in 1800 very, very few are. And, Link, and, the, so, and Lincoln, lives, uh, Lincoln lived his life just before the, the very large take, um, uh, expansion of, of wage labor, when wage labor is clearly becoming a far more important um, issue than it, it would, than it had been at the time when he was born in 1809. <laughs> And so the question is, how do you interpret Lincoln's attitude towards wage labor here? I mean, he's quite explicitly saying that he does not believe that um, uh, people should be fixed into a permanent condition uh, of wage labor in his speech in 1858. And that has led some people to argue, some historians to argue, that Lincoln's understanding of free labor um, was very different from the... Uh, uh, ideology of the Republican Party as it developed in the uh, 1870s and 80s. Um, uh, Eric Foner, who is the most important historian um, to have written about um, the Republican Party in this whole period, period from 18, its founding in the mid-1850s through to the end of Reconstruction, talks about the fracturing of the, of, of the free labor ideology. Um, in the aftermath of the Civil War. And what he means by the fracturing is a, a, essentially a division over this question of whether the ideal um, um, society should be based on the idea that, um, uh, um, that, uh, that, that man should have the um, serious possibility and indeed the expectation uh, of being able to own productive capital in some form or other, whether it's land or whether it's uh, tools. In other words, whether the litmus test for whether um, there is an, a society that enables the possibility of Republican freedom, whether the litmus test for that should be the possibility for people to be able to emancipate themselves from wage labor. Um, and there is, in this 1858 speech, would, would be some evidence of that, some reason to believe that in that fracturing of the free labor ideology, Lincoln would have stood on the side of uh, those who um, rejected the notion of a, uh, of a society that was predicated on a permanent and indeed forever expanding uh, wage earning class. Um, I mean, there's much more I can say because I found this a very rich and stimulating uh, uh, book to read and a very interesting topic. But I think I should probably stop there. Uh, I've probably already exceeded my time there, to which I apologise. Not at all. A richly suggestive uh, commentary. And of course, we we'll want to uh, <coughs> hear Robin respond to that. But first of all, he suggested that it would be a good idea, and I'm sure it's right, that we open uh, up to the floor for any comments and questions you might have. <clears throat> one question concerning the theories of economic development, uh, the historical development. 
Um, we see how um, antiquity uh, led to the medieval economy, and the medieval economy led to mercantilism. Mercantilism led to agricultural capitalism and industrial capitalism, which eventually, according to Marx, would lead to socialism and communism. The stages of economic development through history, um, slavery was a feature of the economies of antiquity. Um, the owners relied on their slaves for their wealth production. Um, the same in the American, the Americas, both America. In North America, it, it's the plantation of the sea, economic unit, a small scale economic unit. In Latin America, it was the latifundia amongst the peasantry of the Latin Americas. Um, where do these slaves fit? Um, my question is, in this sort of theory of economic, theories of economic certain, Marxist wasn't the only theory. There was another one based on the metropolis satellite relationship. That's a fun explanation. I'm wondering what the speakers speak of. The place of the slaves, or of slavery itself, institution, in the American history, um, and it's um, in that part of the process where feudalism, if there was feudalism, gave rise to capitalism, and the agrarian economy had to give way to the growth of industrial capital. And where did slavery fit in? <laughs> I think it probably possibly is. Um, Marx was to some extent taking over this schema of successive stages uh, from, uh, for example, thinkers of the, of the Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, but suddenly it looms very large in that sketch he wrote uh, with Engels, the Communist Manifesto, which is such a wonderful and eloquent and, and indeed uh, prescient uh, document, um, you know, could be read today uh, uh, with uh, very fresh insights into globalization and the rest of it. Um, but he won't all this, I think he was aged then, 29, you know, uh, uh, and it's just a sketch and it's just uh, 10,000 words, the bit on the successive stages. Uh, uh, and um, uh, so obviously it was a very early stage of the development of his ideas. I still think it does, in, you know, in some broad way, um, this sketch of different successive social forms is, is pretty suggestive. But suddenly his own writing in Capital, and then the writing of subsequent Marxists and, um, uh, and scholars who are not Marxists too, has shown that um, to imagine that the rising of capitalism meant the immediate downfall of uh, either serfdom on the one hand or slavery on the other would be to make a huge mistake. Uh, indeed, uh, Marxist writers began to discuss what they called the second serfdom uh, in Eastern Europe, which uh, exacts a toll on the peasantry of uh, the eastern parts of Europe uh, just at the same time as um, capitalism is beginning to surge forward in Western and Northern Europe. And I, myself, in my introduction, did point out that um, the tide of slavery in the New World continued to rise right down to 1860 and until the eve of the, of the Civil War. And this was directly linked to the expansion of cotton textile production. I mean, very, very, very directly related to it and to the development of a new consumer capitalism with its tastes for, I mean, you know, fast food and, uh, 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 you know, sugar and uh, 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 cotton and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, really, capitalism uh, has a sort of uh, search for profit. Uh, and it's not very discriminating in that search for profit. And there are different paths of accumulation. There's a high road and a low road. And capitalists are quite happy to exploit the, the low road, which I'm using to imply extra economic uh, compulsion on producers, outlawing of unions. There is another possible development of capitalism, the high road, where you do allow workers' rights and there is free education and, and so on and so forth. Uh, 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 capitalism itself 
actually embraces both the high road and the low road. And even if you take the high road, you're going to get, you know, social dumping and the suggestion it would be better from some capitalists to go to the low road. We're just in that conjunction at the moment. Get rid of the welfare state and uh, let's embark on the low road is what the neoliberals are now saying. But uh, you do get similar sorts of choices at the time we're looking at here, the 1850s and 1860s and 1870s. Because either there'll be a, a form of bourgeois society where workers' rights uh, can be conquered and can be defended, where there is free education and so on and so forth. Or uh, you'll be thrown back into something, you know, if, if the Confederacy had succeeded uh, 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 or if the early trade union movement had been completely defeated. Uh, so I think you get these continual choices and uh, a, a sort of I mean, there was a, a phrase of Marx to one of his Russian correspondents, I believe. I don't wish to impose a marche générale upon the whole of humanity. Not everybody has to go through all the stages, you know, that, uh, 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 that we've had the stages of feudalism and capitalism, and, but not the Russians, for example. He said to this Russian correspondent, you don't have to uh, uh, go to develop capitalism to its highest point. You maybe uh, can improve on that. Um, so uh, I don't think he was uh, a rigid, uh, uh, relig rigidly wedded to these, this schema. Uh, but certainly it did provide a fascinating early sketch. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, a few uh, questions. Can you sort of comment a, a little bit on the fact that Lincoln himself, at least for a time, owned slaves, and how and how he uh, was able to reconcile that fact with his, with his ideological opposition to slaves? Um, also, in your view, do you think that uh, the Republican Party, from its origins, was ever a coherent political philosophy distinct from other political currents, or was it? really just political factions who mm -hmm. wanted uh, a, slight, a slight difference from the Democrats, who were also proposed a political faction. And you, you, you mentioned, you mentioned um, in your large, large discussion um, the, the, the importance of, of German immigration to uh, American health influence politics. Well, it was followed after the Civil War by an even larger scale immigration from Europe. And I believe one third actually returned to you. What were the roots of the fact that there has never been an organized left in America? I know it's a hotly contested issue, but uh, would you have any comments on that? I'll, I'll quickly, there's, there's a particular point you raised which I'd be very interested in Adam's views on. That, um, this question which you confidently assert that at one point in his life uh, Abraham Lincoln owned slaves. I'm not aware of that. I am aware that his wife uh, and his wife's family were quite heavily involved in slave owning. I mean, I don't think his, his wife owned slaves, but certainly her family were heavily involved in slave owning. Uh, uh, and that didn't seem to stop Lincoln being making it, I mean really what separates him out from some of the other Republican contenders is he focused actually like a laser beam on the issue of slavery. Uh, he wasn't the most radical of them, but he was the most consistent on harping on this particular topic. Uh, I think there was, uh, if you want to look at inconsistencies, I think uh, on one occasion he did represent a slave owner in a, a legal case where he was trying to recover his runaway slave. So, uh, 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 but, uh, and, and there may be a few other incidents of that sort. I mean, I think lawyers who are in a search for briefs, you know, uh, uh, anyway, I don't particularly want to justify it, but uh, I, I think that you also see he wrote some fascinating sort of notes to himself on the issue of slavery, where he's sort of debating the issue, and uh, they, they do tend to strengthen one's idea that he is... Um, that his commitment on that issue itself was quite genuine. It was, of course, not, and I do try and make this absolutely clear, I mean, 
he did some of the racial ideas of, of his age, uh, he shared, and he deferred to the racialism of others too, in, in unfortunate ways, uh, sometimes in disgraceful ways. He favored colonization of freed slaves uh, uh, back to Africa. Well, you know, many of them not being born actually in Africa. So the whole thing was, as one of the leaders of the African American community, told him in a, in a face-to-face -face encounter, it was disgraceful, uh, his uh, uh, attempt to export them back to a country that was completely foreign to them. Uh, and um, uh, I do think it's interesting that um, Lincoln was capable uh, of responding to African-American opinion. Uh, someone like Frederick Douglass, who was one of the most radical leaders of ab uh, black abolitionists, uh, was someone who, whose views were sought out by, by Lincoln and whose help was sought out by Lincoln. So I sort of chalk that up uh, 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 to his credit. Uh, my own reading of his racial views is goes, uh, I'll just mention it very briefly because maybe um, uh, uh, Adam can comment on this too. Um, I think that he genuinely found slavery disturbing and, and wretched from, from, the, from the South, from his earliest thinking on the topic. Uh, he was always held back in confronting it. Uh, and he was, in that sense, a sort of moderate. Because he was also an American nationalist. And he respected the founders and the compromises they'd made. And he was not willing to challenge those compromises. So you could say there's that powerful element of moderation in his position. Probably if he hadn't been a person like that, he would never have been elected president anyway. The interesting thing is that he gradually works his way out of that commitment, and he sees that the Union can only be saved through emancipation. And that's a sort of argument that he shares with, that Marx was vigorously putting forward in his arguments. And just finally, on the question of the Republican Party, Actually, Eric Foner's book, something like Free Soil, Free Men, Free Land, or the other way around, uh, it's a really marvellous and uh, definitive account of ideology. There was the radical current that Adam has mentioned, and I just give you one name here, not deeply known to Americans, it's interesting, but there was uh, a, a former vice president and a former uh, co congressman and Republican leader called Skylar Koufax. And when uh, he was the person who successfully introduced a motion introducing a progressive income tax in 1862 in Congress, and at the same time he unsuccessfully proposed a tax on the banks and the capitalists. So Schuyler Colfax, a very senior Republican who becomes vice president in the late 1860s, actually proposes uh, a tax on, and he says, I cannot in conscience go back to my constituencies who are farmers or working men who are paying tax. Uh, I can't go back and say, why should the capitalists, why should the millionaires pay no tax? So that, that's a, that would count still today as a slight, somewhat radical idea. Um, on, the, on, that, uh, on that last point, I think the, the point about people, about, about the radical Republicans, and this was certainly true of Horace Greeley, the character I was talking about, is that they're, they're not, um, you can't, think of them as anti-capitalists, but what they're definitely passionately against is unproductive capital. That's what they don't like. They want they, they, they favor taxes um, on banks and they hate financiers and they, they rhetorically use the idea of financiers um, a great deal, including during the Civil War, the notion of the shoddyites, the people who are allegedly, and in some cases genuinely were making very large money out of war contracts. Um, it's, it's a dislike of, of, un, of what they consider to be unproductive capital, an excessive accumulation of capital. Um, I mean, to go back to the, the, the Lincoln and... Um, I mean, Lincoln, yes, I mean, uh, Robin is right. I mean, Lincoln, Lincoln never owned slaves, but, but the Todd family, who he married into, Mary Todd family, who came from Kentucky, um, did own some slaves. So, um, and... Uh, Lincoln had some contact with that. In fact, his, his, his kind of his best friend, like the man with whom he shared a bed for 11 years, Joshua Speed, um, 
uh, went and inherited, and there have been some people who've written books speculating on the, on the nature of the, of the, of the bed sharing. Um, but Joshua Speed inherited some slaves later in, uh, in his life and went back to Kentucky to run a plantation. And Lincoln has an interesting correspondence with Joshua Speed in which he, you know, he kind of talks around this issue. Um, but as Robin said, I think Lincoln was, I mean, Lincoln in, in 1864 said, if, if, if slavery is not wrong, then nothing is wrong. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. And the evidence, so far as we have, you know, the evidence for Lincoln's early life is in some ways quite fragmentary. There's very little in the way of direct writing. He didn't keep a diary or anything like that. Um, but um, there isn't any, there's no clear evidence that contradicts that later claim. Um, uh, I think that the, 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 the question is how important is not whether Lincoln in some abstract sense thought slavery was wrong. I think he probably did always think that. The question is how important that issue was in Lincoln's thinking. And, and my reading of Lincoln is that it really wasn't until 1854 uh, that slavery became the central preoccupation um, that it certainly was from that date onwards. And the significance of 1854 was that that was the date when Congress passed the act which organized the territories of Kansas and Nebraska in the West in such a way that opened them up to the possibility of slavery. Um, and this is interesting in, I mean, Lincoln's passionate re uh, rejection of the Kansas and Nebraska Act, which was shared by many other Northerners, and kind of led pretty much directly to the formation of the Republican Party. Um, the problem for, for Lincoln here was that this was a uh, betrayal of his understanding of um, the intentions of the founding fathers. And in this sense, his, I, mean, I agree with what Robin said about there being a, a, a moderating break on, 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 on Lincoln's anti-slavery. But his, his nationalism, which was undoubtedly his most sort of powerful and animating idea in Lincoln's life, was his love of the Union. But his conception of the Union, I would argue, um, was always, in some sense, anti-slavery. Now, that did not mean that he, uh, he favored the immediate abolition of slavery. He never did. He, he never proposed the intervention of the federal government in, in what was all, everybody agreed was a, a locally regulated institution. Congress could not pass constitution. He could not pass a law abolishing slavery in the state of Mississippi or something. And Lincoln never went anywhere near those kinds of ideas. That was the preserve of the abolition. But his notion of the American Union was one, and this was a phrase he used again and again and again, was one in which, which had put slavery on the path to ultimate extinction. That was always his formulation, on the path to ultimate extinction. Um, and so his reaction to the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 was that you have betrayed, you know, this Congress has betrayed this notion that we could tolerate slavery for a while so long as it is a local and a shrinking institution. Now, the, the great... And difficulty with sort of trying to understand this historically is that this was com this was a, a complete distortion of American history. In fact, throughout Lincoln's life, slavery, far from being on the path to ultimate extinction, had been greatly expanding. And and so, what's interesting is how Lincoln was able to reconcile that manifest historical reality with his idealized, romanticized notion of the Union as nevertheless being dedicated to the proposition of equality, as he was later to, 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 to put it in the Gettysburg Address, and, and it founded in this notion that slavery was at least someday going to be um, extinguished. And yet he managed to do that. I mean, his nationalism was such that it, it somehow um, bridged that reality, the, the reality and his idealized notion of what the, of what the nation was. Um, so, you know, my, my only slight modification of, of, of Robin's comments about, about Lincoln is that I don't see his nationalism and his anti-slavery ideas as, as, as it were, two separate moral goods being in tension with one another. I think for Lincoln, they were conveniently um, enfolded in on one another. On the, and finally, on the, on the subject of the Republican Party, I agree with the questioner, I have to say, but I think... Uh, the uh, very famous book, which, which Robin mentioned, does, does a brilliant job of, of characterizing the sort of labor ideology of the Republican Party in a particular moment. Um, in fact, there were huge variations within the Republican Party, even at that, even at that moment of its creation in 1856, 1857. Um, and I think it's actually more fruitful to understand American political parties in the 19th century and in the 20th century as well, for that matter, as um, 
uh, as, as vehicles which, which contained within them ideological coherent, um, ideologically coherent entities and um, movements, but which I think that the search for, the, as it were, the ideological core of any American political party pretty much any time is, a, is, a, is probably a fruitless quest, I think. Thank you. Well, now look, the <coughs> clock is moving towards seven, and so uh, we're sufficiently small a group that you could put any further comments or questions uh, personally to, to uh, Robin and Adam. But I want to give Robin the opportunity to, to wrap if he's got um, something that perhaps you want to come back on from Adam's comments. Yeah, I, I suppose. Um, uh, uh, I, I've just got something else really to add to my own comments, <laughs> but it is a, it is, it does respond to some of these issues we've been addressing, which I think are very important. And um, I did ultimately feel that if one's going to be critical of Lincoln, uh, and critical to some extent of some of Marx's judgments, I do think there is a, a way in which um, you know this was a, a, a great power in the making. And I don't think that uh, Lincoln's nationalism, to which allusion has been made, always sensitized people. I mean, he, he was, for example, himself an opponent of the Mexican War, which was an absolutely shameful war, and he said so. And that was his first speech in the Congress. Mm -hmm. However, he did accept the results of that war. <laughs> uh, it would have been difficult to do otherwise, but he, he, he sort of obviously went along with the fact the United States had been enlarged in a rather dramatic way at the expense of its neighbor. Um, there is an interesting, I mean, this nationalism of Lincoln, could one compare it to Bismarck? You know, Bismarck is a great national unifier. Uh, uh, both, you, you, I, I think um, uh, both of them reflect this new 19th century democratic nationalism. Lincoln, from the standpoint of, of uh, uh, a son of a poor farmer, and Bismarck from the absolutely opposite standpoint of uh, a, a Junker, uh, uh, a sort of Prussian landlord. But uh, in a way, Bismarck was bright enough to see that you needed, for example, a Reichstag, you needed a parliament, you needed to give people a vote. So real power lay with the German ruling class and the with Prussia, and, um, uh, uh, but at least the formality of things was that everybody had the vote. And also Bismarck saw that it was necessary to address the labor question and to come up with uh, pensions and welfare arrangements and so forth. Now, if you look at um, Lincoln, I'm not sure he, I, I think you very accurately, you know, he thought this world of petty producers was going forward. Uh, uh, I actually do give some references in my introduction to, the, to work which shows that actually the US working class was just changing at this very point and actually was highly unrealistic. Even though some of them were able to acquire land under the Homestead Program, but actually petty producers, including small farmers, were on a high to nothing. Uh, so, uh, and actually, if you look at the way they fought the war, okay, emancipation, good. But um, he should have constructed, I mean, the fact he rejected, or the Congress or the Republican Party didn't follow what Schuyler Colfax was advocating, was a, a, a retrograde step. And instead of that, I mean, it, it meant that the United States didn't. De Defend, develop a modern system of taxation, and it didn't develop a modern system of administration. It was all ad hoc and semi-privatized. A lot of the money actually came from Jay Cook, uh, and, uh, who was a freelance financier with his commission agents. And so instead of having a proper tax system, which the US doesn't have to this day, it uh, uh, was um, in hoc to Wall Street and uh, uh, Jay Cook and so forth. Uh, I've elided the century or so more a bit too abruptly and quickly there because there was an important, you know, in 1913 there was a very important change 
uh, which is under the pressure of populists and progressives, the US did make, it didn't have a fully modern tax system, but it made, for example, income tax, progressive income tax have been declared unconstitutional. This is, of course, after Lincoln's assassination, but only a few years after. And somehow that, and also the banking system, people say it was centralized, but not really. There was still something like 15,000 banks, and they were not properly regulated. So basically, there was a, an inclination. Oh, another important thing is, Lincoln was very much against the sub-treasury scheme, wasn't he? Uh, and the sub-treasury scheme sounds an awful bit of jargon, perhaps, to you, but funnily enough, it's just what the populists later identified. They said that there should be a pool of public credit in every county of every state in the Union, and this should be available under popular control to advance uh, loans to small uh, and medium producers. Um, so that was an interesting utopian idea, not so utterly utopian. Uh, there was a guy I mentioned uh, called Richard Hinton, who was actually a British radical. I gave a big billing to the Germans. There were actually quite a few British anti-slavery people, and there was this guy Hinton, who was um, the organizer of the international section in Washington. And um, he was very interested in ideas of radical taxation and cooperatives and, 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 and um, sub-treasury uh, ideas, the, these sort of ideas. So that was one of the under, radical undercurrents that Lincoln never showed any interest in. And it's not, I mean, what he really did with finance is say, this is not for me, I'm no economist, and I'll leave uh, people like Chase and... Uh, I'll let the, the bankers decide what's best, uh, to put it very crudely. And I think allowing the bankers to decide what's best, well, from the standpoint of 2011, we can see that that was problematic. And uh, all one can say is just Lincoln, this wasn't uh, an area of his thought that he sufficiently concentrated on. And they did need gigantic sums, you know, uh, billions and the, uh, uh, billions uh, uh, to fight that war. And they didn't raise the money in the best way. Well, uh, Robin is a polymath, and uh, you look at the handout, which is on the chairs, you'll see that one of his uh, books is on banking, uh, and uh, nothing could be more utopian than the idea that we're not going to go on strike next week with respect to pensions. So there's quite a lot of um, germane uh, information uh, and thoughts coming through over our perfectly legitimate span of uh, 100, and, well, we started in 1800 in some respects, so 211 years. <clears throat> I was struck, just as I was um, looking at uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the schedule for the next week at the Institute, that next uh, Thursday we launch another book uh, written by, uh, or compiled by the late Fred Halliday on Francisco Camaño. Uh, the uh, uh, radical army officer from the Dominican Republic. And it is actually compiled in, in a way not dissimilar to this, uh, and brings me to think that uh, we're very lucky at the Institute to have, within the space of a few days, uh, to celebrate the work of, of people who uh, continue and uh, lately, with, in the case of Fred, uh, were part of the broad new left movement. Uh, characterized by being animated, by being authoritative, knowledgeable, original, uh, and illuminating. Uh, all of which you've heard this evening from the presentations of Robin and Adam, and which you can follow up with an obvious next step of purchasing, I don't know, of any agreeable discount to open for a capitalism. There is a, a discount, yeah. The book at the back. Uh, if you're not able to do that, uh, you can have a free drink further back still. Um, but before we do that, we should thank our speaker.